So today, children, we're going to talk about Nazi cults. Get out your tinfoil hats, everyone. We're getting conspiracy-ish on multiversity. You are tuning in to the Multiversity Project, a podcast for higher dimensional education. Join us as we explore philosophy, science, history, and the great unknown. Hey kids, if you want to make a milkshake of evil, take one part Nazi, one part cult. And that's what we're going to discuss today. So after World War II, about 9,000 Nazis who have uh, factual evidence that indicates 9,000 Nazis escaped to here in Argentina and also to, to Chile. And some of them did some pretty disgusting things. So one fellow or one uh, not so much gentleman started a cult in rural Chile called Colonia Dignidad where he continued to torture and perhaps harbor other Nazis. So pretty gross and disgusting, but also kind of interesting from this human psychological perspective. So let's talk about it. I am Katie. I'm Chris. I'm Kurt, reporting to you from Cordoba, Argentina, the one time home of probably at least a few Nazis. So let's get started with a little overview of what took place, particularly at Colonia Dignidad, which was a Nazi-run cult community in Chile. Colonia Dignidad was founded post-World War II by Germans to create a German cultural community. It started out seemingly rather innocuous, highly religious, evangelical Christian agricultural community until the arrival of Paul Schaefer, who was a high-ranking Nazi, in 1961. He went on to become the leader of Colonia Dignidad and turned it into something much more sinister. Members of Colonia Dignidad were essentially held captive. They brought over a lot of the Nazi tactics of watchtowers, German shepherds, utilized barbed wire, torture techniques for dissenting members, etc. It was characterized by a strict fundamentalist interpretation of Christianity, hard labor seven days a week for both children and adults. Residents were basically held there against their will and childhood sexual abuse was rampant. We watched a documentary and read accounts of some of the survivors of Colonia Dignidad uh, what did you guys, what did you guys think of all this? What was your reaction to all this when you learned about it? Uh, kind of a dark curiosity. Yeah, as you said, it, after World War II, it seems like the Nazis just kind of disappeared. And I guess they kind of did largely disappear from the public eye, but they certainly lived out the rest of their lives in other places. And some of them were very, very sinister people. And this Paul Schaefer guy, uh, sounds especially sinister. He uh, luckily eventually was locked up, but much later in his life. He, I mean, he, it sounds like he was in charge of this cult for like at least 40 years, something like that. Not that long. He was in charge of this cult from 1961, and he ended up needing to flee <clears throat> in 1996. In the 90s, after Pinochet was de deposed, basically, it came under a lot more scrutiny. So they cleaned up their act a bit, so to speak, and there started being lawsuits and criminal investigations against Paul Schaefer. So he actually escaped to Argentina, um, was not arrested until I believe it was 2004 or 2005, now in prison in Chile for child sexual abuse. So right. it's pretty intense, like with the previous cults we've looked at, you can see how the cult leaders try to isolate people. So in this case, they were isolating the children from the adults. So the mm -hmm. children didn't even know who their parents were a lot of the time, or if they did, they had to figure it out on their own. So all of the children would refer to all of the adults as aunt and uncle. And Paul Schaefer being the leader was, the, was called the permanent uncle. Like uh, it's almost like saying big brother or br brother number one, like in the Khmer Rouge. 
And so it's a little alarming the level of control that he had over them because the children basically didn't have anybody to go to and there was so much trust given in Schaefer. So it was like a highly centralized system and so that al allows this kind of abuse of power. So pretty devastating the amount of control that he was able to have over these people and especially that he was able to have over these kids. Like At its peak, there were maybe 300 to 500 people living in Colonia de Dignidad, including many, many children who were born there. They were living in Chile but didn't speak a word of Spanish didn't really know anything about the outside world other than maybe one or two news articles that the leaders would bring in for them to be able to read. It was not only control from within, but also it was enabled from the outside because Paul Schaefer had connected himself with Pinochet, the dictator of Chile. And having this horrific compound within the borders was actually very useful to the dictator. And I think that's a lot of what allowed it to go on for so long. I mean, there's evidence that Pinochet would send political dissidents to Colonia Dignidad to be tortured or disappeared. Mass graves have been un uncovered there. Old car parts, with license plate numbers belonging to dissident college students. Pretty horrific stuff. I noticed an, another parallel with Jonestown about the fake articles or fake, fake news that they were promoting within the colony. So the, the presenting all this doomsday stuff like how the outside world is just a mess, there's destruction, there's war everywhere, commies are taking over or whatever it was, just like w with what Jim Jones did. Mm -hmm. That's another way to get people from even thinking that they might want to escape. Like on the one hand, you have actual guards and dogs and mm. sniper towers keeping them in. But on the other hand, you have this disinformation campaign where you're saying that actually you're keeping, you're keeping them safe. Another thing that was, that was interesting, and this is also kind of a parallel to Jonestown, at least at the beginning, is that the outside perception of it was relatively positive in the local community. There were actually some Chileans that sent their kids there to have an education. Yes. Again, similar like with, with Jones, he had his sort of PR scheme by buddying up with a lot of politicians. In the case of Schaefer, he set up a public hospital just outside the community and had his doctors working there and everything. And they they actually, you know, it's kind of weird to think about. They did, did a lot of good for poor Chileans who needed medical assistance. They, I think there was one article that said, the amount of patients they treated was in the tens of thousands. Right, over a couple of decades, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so like all cults, they do things to help their image to be able to continue functioning. Do, yeah. do you think, so but not Schaefer, like the, ba the badge one, what was <laughs> the The orange people? Oh, the yeah. Rajneeshis? <laughs> right. <laughs> the Rajneeshis didn't have that PR thing down. <laughs> yeah, not quite, but maybe on the in the, on the inside they actually weren't that destructive. Yes, yes, that was like an inside-out cult. <laughs> yeah. So Schaefer arrived to Chile having fled charges in Germany of pedophilia and child sexual abuse, and according to basically all accounts, he continued that from within Colonia Dignidad. Do you think that he actually had strong Christian beliefs or, or, or some kind of religious motivation for running a community this way? Like, do you think there were any quote unquote good motives to this cult whatsoever? Or, this is one of those cases where I don't see something that got distorted. It, it seems like it really was some kind of horrific torture control cult from as soon as he started running it. Yeah, I, I think it, it's j just about the clearest example of hell on earth that I've, that I've ever read about. Uh, well, other than I guess just all out war, but yeah, no, clearly the guy was a pedophile. Um, there were reports that he had, like he kept a bed, a small child sized bed next to his bed. And he would keep his favorite sprinters who were his child servants who would run and do tasks for him. And whichever, whichever children were the most obedient and, and did the tasks that he gave them, 
the fastest and the best, he would re- reward by having them sleep in his room. And uh, pretty disgusting stuff. Yeah. So again, it's it's very similar to Jonestown, the, the way it's set up. So, so Schaefer was publicly talking about how disgusting sexual acts is and they separate you from God, but then within his bedroom, abusing children. Very similar to Jim Jones. So this is this is like this is the echoes of history. It's all a bit weird, right? It it does seem to me that one of the things that sets aside cults from other sort of culty organizations is that the leadership of the organization in a cult is like explicitly uh, philosophically opposite from the philosophy that they ostensibly espouse. So they have this like, oh, you know, we should be pure. We should not do sexual acts. They separate us from God or what have you. And then they just do the opposite. Um, so it seems like the leadership of many culty organizations is that way. And I think maybe that's even a defining characteristic of a cult. I think yeah, I've a- heard that Scientology is the same way. Like a, a, lo- a lot of people who uh, like a, one person who left, I think her name is Linda Ramini. She, she talked about trying to, well, as part of that organization, you had to write people up, like if you saw them breaking the rules. But at certain points, she would see David Miscavige breaking the rules and try to write him up. And they're like, well, we don't do that here. Yeah, it's it's so common that it's almost a trope of cult leaders having some kind of a harem or often they'll write something into their own doctrine so they can have multiple wives or so that it's important to consummate with the leader or, or something like this. I mean, these are personalities that want total control and everything for themselves. Well, and I think this is the problem that a lot of um, sort of libertarian types have with government in general or, or, or just anarchists in general, because they see that, you know, the, the rule, there's a small subset of the population that the rules don't apply to. I think that really is corrosive to the proper functioning of a society or of a community when it's clear that the leaders of the organization who are forcing everybody to follow this code are themselves not beholden to the code. Yeah. So it's like with this, with politicians in the US, a lot of them have to portray themselves as, as very religious people, but they're actually philanderers. I remember there was that clip where it's a presidential debate and somebody asked Newt Gingrich if he'd had an affair with another woman and instead of addressing the question or denying it or anything he just he just attacked the the person for asking the question and it was never asked again so yeah there's a there's a big cult-like thing about government for sure but I, I would say something like colonia dignidad is take the worst of government take the worst of cults concentrate it into a tiny isolated area and a country where none of the members speak the language. So they're even more isolated in a rural area protected by one of the worst of governments, a dictator and, and just magnify everything. Yes. So a couple of the sources that we read actually almost explicitly said it was a state. And one example of that was when they expanded the territory, there was a nearby nunnery and they went in and took it over by force and forced the, the nuns out and tried to make them appear evil. Like they released these orgy sex tapes of the nuns and then burned the houses and took the, the, the church or the buildings that were there. So just like a medieval conqueror or something like that, go and burn the houses of your enemies and take their resources. Mm-hmm. And if, if a state is defined as a monopoly on physical force, like the use of force within a given geographic territory, it, I think it certainly applies as a small state. And they had, I mean, maybe you wouldn't call it a police force, but they had guards enforcing the rules. They had their leader. They had a, a work program. Yeah, I, I don't know. It wasn't a taxation system. It was basically... You could call it a commune, but really it was like a forced labor camp. People were working 14-hour days, seven days a week from the point of childhood. It was completely all-encompassing. It was self-sufficient. Everything included. Yeah. (laughs) So interestingly, Colonia Dignidad didn't really disappear 
after Pinochet was ousted in 1990, it came under some more scrutiny. People started being able to leave. Some of the former members started speaking out. Paul Schaefer had to flee, as we said, when he started coming under legal scrutiny. They changed their name to Via Baviera, or Via, Via what was it? Via Baviera. Baviera. Okay, they changed their name to Via Baviera. Like in the 19- Bavarian Villa, right? Yes, the Bavarian Villa. And they continue to operate. It's still a community. It's run by a woman who was the daughter of Schaefer's right-hand man. And it's an agricultural community, Christian community, German-speaking community, survives mostly off of agriculture and tourism. I guess they have a hotel there and a nice little lake. Many of the same people still living there. Oh, so just as an aside, real quick, I think it's important that people know this because I, I didn't realize this. Pinochet, after he was ousted from, well, he was never ousted from government. He, he was taken down, he was stepped down uh, as military dictator. He retained his title as the commander of chief of the army. And then he was, March 1998, he's sworn in as a senator for life. And the Chilean constitution is still Pinochet's constitution. Wow. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. So, but there's a a democratic process described in that constitution, correct? Yes. The the way that I heard that he was ousted from power is he was essentially voted out of power because he lost the democratic election. Yes. So he opened the doors to to democracy and the people voted against him ultimately. But the the constitution still has certain things which are a a bit weird. I'm not, I, I don't know too much about it, but they have certain things that maybe a democratic government shouldn't be able to do. Interesting. I was not aware of that. Pinochet is an interesting dictator because I hate to say this, but Chile went from being a very poor country to a very prosperous country under yes. his rule. And since then, I would never suggest that the ends justify the means in his case, but I think that Pinochet's reign is maybe one of the most classic historical examples of the question like do the ends justify the means in his case Mm. the means being torture and disappearance of dissidents he's famous for rounding up communists and throwing them into the ocean out of helicopters here's a a weird thing you know there are still pinochetistas in chile today and actually a friend of mine is a pinochetista but i never had the courage to ask her what exactly does she advocate (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just this kind of far right philosophy right. where, yeah, you know, yeah. like pull, we, pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of thing. I think yeah, that's what, yeah. And kind of a, kind of a more authoritarian government. I mean, there, there's been kind of a, almost like a reawakening of anti-democratism or anti-democracy where a lot of people I'm seeing on the right and the left are saying, well, you know, democracy was a good experiment, but maybe it doesn't work that well or something. Of course, that's been an idea forever, but It's almost like people are saying, yeah, maybe the government should just be this kind of corporate hierarchy almost um, with a CEO or something like that. And maybe that's the best way for a country to get stuff done. So maybe that's not what Pinochetistas believe, but that's kind of how I see their their philosophy or sort of the far right philosophy. To me, it's pretty disturbing that there are reactionary movements that exist today that want to call for such authoritarian regimes, types of power that are so not only easily exploitable for and and open to abuse, but oftentimes are are kind of inherently abusive. But no one, well, I don't know, maybe some people can deny, but it, it is true that the Chilean government and authoritarian regimes in general get things done quickly. So if your goal is to get things done, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's the motivation. That's an interesting thing. I've heard people make the case that what happens when a gov- government seizes control of industry, like say in, in Nazi Germany, maybe for, for the next 10 years, there will be a lot of innovation because it's, it's centrally controlled and it becomes efficient, like this sort of military, strongly hierarchical model. But after about 10 years, you start to see that drop off so they don't innovate so much anymore because now you've got career bureaucrats who are in there, whereas previously you've taken the best from the private sector and put them in a 
very cushy government position. All right. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about some of these other communities in Argentina. Colonia Dignidad was a horrific and powerful story, but it was a very small community. The, the vast majority of Nazis that escaped went to Argentina, uh, many of them specifically around the area of Patagonia. The town of Bariloche has thousands of, should we call them Nazi refugees, Nazi escapees, who went on to establish themselves there. And if you look at pictures of this town, it looks like it's out of Bavaria with the architecture and, and everything and, and the people. They basically established a whole society there. And we're not just talking about random Nazis, we're talking about people like Mengele, Adolf Eichmann, who was kind of the architect behind the Holocaust. These people went on living. Kurt, have you seen any influences, any, any German influence since you've been in Argentina? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are people around who could be German and you wouldn't know. And I think some people even have German last names, but it's not necessarily about Nazis. I mean, Chile and Argentina have had connections with Europe for a long time. So especially Argentina is seen as the Europe of South America. Yeah. And and another thing that I'd like to add is that while, you know, these 9,000 Nazis or something like that who escaped from Germany were Nazis, their descendants may or may not be Nazis, you know, like maybe their, their parents, you know, indoctrinated them that Adolf Hitler was the greatest man ever or something like that. But, you know, maybe they were just born there and they're just trying to live their lives and, you know, we shouldn't blame them for the sins of their parents, I guess. Right. When it does come to their parents, we watched a documentary, well, kind of a controversial documentary, conspiracy com- documentary called Grey Wolf suggesting this idea that perhaps Hitler actually escaped to one of these communities in Argentina. Even take, taking a, a little detour to Colonia Dignidad, like he would be uh, seeking refuge there and then passed along trying to cross the Andes on a horse or something like that. Yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are lots of different ideas about it. There was an Argentinian government official, at least claimed to be, that claims to have witnessed Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun escaping into Argentina, getting off of a submarine in 1945 after he supposedly committed suicide. That was from a declassified document by the FBI. What do you guys make of these conspiracy theories? Do you think there's anything, anything to this? I think it's plausible. So it's kind of funny when, say, you read that Wikipedia article talking about conspiracy theories about what happened to Hitler, and it kind of poo poos the the whole thing and has this this perspective towards the mainstream or the government accepted perspective. Like the FBI is like, no, nah, it never happened. You know, there's nothing to back that up. But the, the evidence that Hitler actually died in a bunker is actually pretty slim. So there used to be some fragments of a skull. People said that was Hitler's skull. When they finally tested it, it turned to be the skull of an old woman. They did apparently find some teeth, which mm-hmm. according to Hitler's dentist matched the dental records. So that's, that's something, but you know, you can survive perfectly fine without teeth. So who knows what that really means. When I mention it to people here, not that I have a big sample space, but I've asked two or three people, do you think it's plausible if, if Hitler escaped here? And they were like, yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? You know, if this was a man of, of resources, he was respected within his circles. Of course, he had access to military. It wouldn't be surprising if he could get access to a submarine and travel across the world. So, yeah, why not? Yeah, I read that that Wikipedia like conspiracy theories about Adolf Hitler article um, that you mentioned, and it did seem really like unnecessarily dismissive of the evidence. It was like some people think this, but this was thoroughly debunked by this one guy, and it's like. Who's this one guy? <laughs> you know? Well, okay. So they did find, it wasn't just individual okay. teeth. They found a, a jaw that had teeth ah. that a dental expert compared to x-rays of Hitler's teeth and said that they match. Okay. So. Yeah, fair enough. So that's, a, that's something. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's something a little bit more. Hitler was yeah. known to utilize body doubles and also it seems very 
possible that something like dental records could be mistaken or maybe the x-ray that was thought to be Hitler's wasn't actually Hitler's or, or, or who knows. I, I don't think it's such a crazy idea. I didn't find extremely strong evidence either way, but I agree with you guys that just to dismiss it seems a little bit premature. Yeah. So with the, the Grey Wolf documentary, it had this supposed testimony from a, a lot of people from Hitler's doctor when he was in his advanced years. But I, I looked up just briefly, I tried, I tried to Google, his name was Dr. Otto Lehmann, and I couldn't find anything confirming that he'd written this testimony or that it was difficult to confirm that, it, that he existed. Likewise, I tried to look up Ursula Hitler or U Uschi Hitler, and I couldn't find much information about Hitler's supposed daughter with, with Eva Brown either. So, you know, I think that's a marks against the documentary. As it looks like the documentary is the only source for a lot of these testimony. The documentary and the book that it was based off of, which was right. done with independent research. Okay, yeah. So maybe if we look deeper into it, we'd find more to support it. I don't know. It was also yeah. telling with the Wikipedia article about the Grey Wolf film that a lot of the the controversies were about circumstantial things. So it was things like they advertised this this movie on Stormfront, a well-known white supremacist site or something like that. I'm like, okay. So is it, are they trying to smear dirt on it? Or I, I mean, I guess that's a legitimate controversy. That's something that is controversial, but it, but the contra like three out of four controversies were not about the, the facts of the film or the alleged facts, which was kind of weird. I mean, I, I don't know why, anybody would bring that up. I mean, clearly neo-Nazis are probably interested in what happened to Hitler after World War II. I mean, it seems like yeah. something they would be interested in. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I, I can see why you would bring that up because if right. the documentary creators themselves are in charge of the advertising. If I was making a documentary, even if I thought it would be interesting to neo-Nazis, I wouldn't advertise it on a neo-Nazi site. It does suggest that the creators at the very least, weren't opposed to associating with neo-Nazis. Was this the creators that advertised it or just some random person who posted it on their on the Stormfront site? Apparently, it was part of their marketing strategy. At least that's how it's represented in the Wikipedia article. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. In that case, that's... No, a, I mean, that's in the film, it's, it says the most hated man or the most evil man of the 20th century, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think they were really Nazi sympathizes and it's just maybe a poorly thought out marketing strategy i don't yeah. know maybe it was successful for them but they yeah. <laughs> a little bit <laughs> in, in yeah. poor taste for sure i wouldn't mm. say that the documentary seemed very authoritative having watched it it, it was it, well produced though I, i'll say that i mean they got the argentine accents and everything a whole a bunch of actors the acting seemed quite good costumes and everything <laughs> might be worth watching for conspiracy buffs out there yeah worth watching for entertainment purposes anyway and I, I do think that these ideas that maybe Hitler didn't commit suicide are worth looking into or, or thinking about a little bit because honestly other than what the government says the evidence doesn't seem extremely strong either way yeah well it's kind of funny actually because I remember when when I was growing up there's a popular conception that nobody knew how Hitler died and now it seems like it's supposed to be established fact that he committed suicide. So I don't know if I was just out of the loop or what. Yeah, if you look it up now, there's a, there's a bunch of headlines from the Smithsonian and several other publications that are like conspiracy theorists debunked dental record analysis proves that these Hitler conspiracy theories are 100% false. It's Obviously, very... the Smithsonian visited Argentina. Yeah. I mean, this is what they say about, you know, 9-11. So <laughs> just go to show how, how authoritative they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you have to back that up, Chris. <laughs> you can't leave, let that dangle without, without uh, just it would, it would It would take more than the, the rest of this episode to explain okay, that. Okay, that's true. <laughs> you can search it for yourself, though. All right. So the, the point is that you don't believe that 
nine eleven were uh, went down according to the official story. That's that's what you're saying. Yeah, no. The thing that convinced a lot of people that that you know um, the official story was true, which is crazy, is that uh, Popular Mechanics came out with an article and was like, all of the other possible you know explanations for what happened on nine eleven are definitely debunked, and this is why. And it's like, okay. So popular mechanics yes. and like, and maybe like the Smithsonian too, I think <laughs> kind of, you know, government mouthpieces and it's like, okay, well, obviously the government's going to come out and say, you know, our story is true. That doesn't mean it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you have a lot of resources behind it, you can kind of buy the facts, right? Yeah. If you have enough control over uh, the media and or, yeah, or, yeah. If you have enough funding, you can, I mean, this is this is a well documented fact in marketing that you know the more times that somebody sees a thing, the more believable it becomes in their mind. So the more funding you have, the basically basically the more times you can have your version of things appear in front of a general audience, and the more true the general audience will think your statement is, uh, regardless of its actual truth value. Yes, I think we should say it takes a lot of assumptions to because it, it's not just about the plausibility of how the buildings fell it also if for 9-11 to be a conspiracy would take the collusion of hundreds if not thousands of people and it it takes a pretty extreme level of dis distrust of government institutions not in just a way that they spin things in their favor but they straight up fabricate things or possibly even murder their own citizens like it, it is kind of a it's kind of a stretch it's not yeah. just well it's it's funny the way you phrase that though because if you're going to say it's a conspiracy well all of the all of the theories about it are conspiracy theories exactly it's like the mainstream theory yeah. is conspiracy theory so <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah conspiracy it's that a bunch of saudis and you know hmm. osama bin laden and maybe some people from other countries they all conspired to fly planes into buildings and knock them over hmm. uh, so that's definitely a conspiracy theory Yes, they're all conspiracy theory in that sense of the word, but I think we know what I mean. Like, for the narrative to be false would would probably require a much bigger conspiracy within the U.S. government. No, it wouldn't. Uh, the government releases statements that are lies, you know, as as a routine. <laughs> like, that's that's something that is is well documented. <laughs> like, the FBI will put out something that's just false, or the CIA will put out something that's just false. Or the media will, you know, parrot something from the government that's just false. I mean, this is something that they do as a matter of routine, as I said. That's a really big claim. I mean, there's is, is it though? tons I, of evidence. I, I mean, <laughs> we all, we all know that governments lie, right? I mean, I mean, maybe they, maybe that not everything that government's saying. Remember is the a weapons lie. of mass destruction thing, right? Yes, that was a lie. <laughs> that was a lie, or somebody being mistaken that got blown up into a big thing because it was a it was a good excuse for a war that they wanted i mean there are plenty of other lies too like the gulf of Com tonkin disaster and remember the nsa saying oh we don't spy on americans <laughs> yeah and every time Fair. snowden released a new leak they would they would backtrack and be like oh yes it is it is a bit like that but you know it's all fine and then they they'd release a little more and they'd have to update their position. So that yeah, was no, I, really funny to watch that. <laughs> no, I, I agree with no. you. I just wanted to push back a tiny bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it is hard for me to wrap my head around too, because it, like sometimes the, these people come up with these articles and they say, well, we're mathematically proven that the, you know, if the amount of people involved in a conspiracy exceeds, say, 6,000, then it's, it becomes so likely that that conspiracy will be exposed within six months to a year, something like that. And it sounds reasonable, but you always have to wonder what assumptions are they using in this mathematical model? And how do you actually, if, if you want to run a successful conspiracy, how do you do it? And that's something that a mathematical model isn't necessarily going to account for because a mathematical model can only integrate the, the conspiracies that have actually come out uh, as uh, that we now know were conspiracies. So how the uh, how in <laughs> blue blazes do you actually create a model that's representative of reality? Because you don't have the full data. 
Well, and another right. thing to point out is that just debunking one particular or saying, you know, one particular version of the conspiracy theory is, is implausible doesn't verify the official story. It just debunks that particular conspiracy theory. Yes. Right? So, so when somebody says, oh, you know, um, the official story is a lie. And then as Katie was saying, somebody claims, oh, well, that means that 6,000 people had to you know, collude. No, I mean, just the person who wrote this, the official story <laughs> had to collude, you know, and, and, you know, maybe there were, maybe there were a dozen or a hundred other people or something like that. Yes. But when people say, oh, you know, if, if the official story of 9-11 was false, then that means the entire U.S. government was in on it. It's like, no, that's obviously right. not what happened, you know. Probably the most plausible thing is that some organization that isn't part of the U.S. government was influencing members of the U.S. government. That's my personal opinion. I don't know if it's yeah. true. But I, I think it's like, it is true that the more people involved in a conspiracy, the more likely it is to be outed. That mm -hmm. seems very reasonable. But it's, right. a, it's an important yeah. question to ask too. Like, what does it mean for a conspiracy to be outed? Because yes. obviously there's lots of people who come out and say that something that the government said is false all the time. Mm. But that doesn't mean that they're going to be believed and that the history books are going to be revised. Like if we're taking this Hitler escape to South America conspiracy and we're saying that, you know, lots of people would have to be involved. Lots of people would have seen him. It would have been outed. Well, there's lots of people who claim to have seen him, but that yes. doesn't mean that it's accepted or, or even that I accept it. Well, and the other yeah. thing is that for something like 9-11, uh, I would say it has been outed. <laughs> like if you ask people who are not in the US whether they think the official story of 9-11 is true, most people will be like, no, hell no. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I think part of the reason why it's, it, it seems to be, you know, it hasn't been outed yet is because uh, official institutions have not come out and said that because those are the institutions that made up the lie. And so it's like the circular thing. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> The first time I went to Guadalajara, the old Mercado Corona was still standing. And then the next, the next time I, I came, it had been burnt down mysteriously. So a politician had said, actually, we're going to take this down and we're going to build a new Mercado Corona. And then conveniently, it just happened to burn down. And people were like, okay, it's an open secret. We know who did this. Like, it's not, we know your motivations. We know you have the power. We identified the threat in the military sense. We know who likely did this. But then there were people in the streets protesting and they're holding up signs like saying, we want a, a state inquest. We want an inquiry uh, to find out what really happened with Mercado Corona. And I was like, oh, you're a bit idealistic there. Like you think that people who, <laughs> who were involved in this supposedly involved in allegedly involved in this crime are going to reveal their own crimes and that's not going to happen <laughs> not for a while at least i guess the I interesting cannot. question on the hitler escaping to south america thing is that as katie mentioned there is actually an fbi report i think it's an official report that talks about how it's likely that this happened that Hitler escaped to South America. And I guess the question would be, why would the FBI be interested in covering that up? I think that from the American perspective, it sounds a lot nicer if you have a clean end to the story. We won the war, the evil dictator committed suicide, he's dead. The fact that the US government was still looking into his death and the FBI was potentially searching for him for years after he was supposedly dead, doesn't look so good given that they came out with the story that he committed suicide in 1945. Interesting. So they have to have this other lie in order to cover up their original story, which was yeah. also a lie. <laughs> well, maybe it wasn't a lie. Maybe, th maybe they thought it was the truth or maybe yeah, or they, they just didn't know. initially thought it was the truth or they didn't know, but it's much cleaner. It's much cleaner. And I, I do think that one thing that people like when they're constructing a patriotic narrative which world war ii has turned into a big patriotic narrative for the u.s is that they, they want it to be clean and tidy they don't want to talk about the fact well maybe these guilty people actually escape right i i could i could see the the u.s government wanting to avoid having to say i don't know you know they want to look certain about everything mm -hmm. you know? so they're, they're much more likely to just make something up 
and then back it up, like double down on it later when it turns out to be false than to just be like, we don't know. <laughs> Do you think that there are other possible motivations? Well, yeah. I mean, the, the other possible motivation would be that somebody inside the FBI was like a Nazi sympathizer. But that gets, uh, that gets into, into even more dicey uh, conspiracy territory. Well, it's a little bit more specula- speculative and definitely dicier. But there certainly were plenty of Nazi sympathizers in the U.S. at that time. And it's pretty well known that the U.S. brought over a lot of Nazi scientists to do research in the U.S. afterwards. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So Operation Paperclip, right? That sounds right. Yeah. Operation Paperclip was a secret program of the Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency, largely carried off out by special agents, in which more than 1,600 German scientists, engineers, and technicians were brought to the U.S. in the 1940s and 50s from the Nazi party. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm guessing that that would have been really, really negative publicity if that had gotten out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there's a motive for a cover-up. So, what do you guys think are the effects of these kinds of things long-term on society when you have isolated groups of people coming from an extremist ideology who basically found their own town? Do you see that echoing in South America at all? Or like Chris said, do you think they have normal kids that go on to lead normal lives, they get out of the Nazi party and life moves on? I think so, because it's somewhat similar to how immigration normally works. So when you have people come over as immigrants, they bring their own culture with them. But when the, their sons and daughters grow up in that culture, they're likely more to be assimilated. They're going to speak the, the native language of the land and they'll adopt a lot of the cultural norms. I mean, there's, there's probably some little influence it's like people will hold on to some of the good things like the custard tarts or whatever but (laughs) (laughs) but i don't think uh the the torture or something like that is is going to stick around for a long time yeah i mean i think if you looked at at what happened to colonia dignidad after paul sheffer left i I think that's kind of what happens you know you you remove the psychopath from the community and then you have this kind of leaderless community that probably just kind of flows into the surrounding culture over time. It seems so. I mean, it seems that Colonia Dignidad or Villa Baviera has mellowed out quite a bit. It's a tourist destination, certainly not a torture camp anymore, although I would imagine that there's still some echoes of that. A lot of the kids grew up, one of them now is a lawyer, and they're working on filing a class action lawsuit in the next month to try to get compensation from the Chilean government for the torture and slavery that they face as children. That's still going on like today. Yeah, that, that, that's going on today. That's going on today. Next month is when they're planning to file 150 people. So at the very least, we can say that these kids did not take on the ideology of their parents. Well, and who knows what the ideology even was? I mean, it seems like it was just a cult of personality where this Paul Schaefer guy was basically some kind of god. Yeah, Yeah, well, I guess a lot of what they actually believed in kind of gets buried because we what we really see is the the torture and child abuse and all the nasty stuff. That's the stuff that floats to the surface after it's gone. But at least in the moment that people decided to move all the way from Germany to go live in rural Chile, they had to have a lot of faith in in Schaefer. So he must have been preaching something that really appealed to them. I don't know what the essence of that might have been. Yeah, actually, Paul Sheffer's backstory is really shady. Yeah, he was this like pederast molesting children. And that's the reason why he had to escape to South America. But also, you know, he was like this like wandering, uh, like guitarist or something like that. And then he just started preaching. And, And he just started gathering this following of people. And then he ended up, they would pay him 10% of their earnings. Uh, I think. Yeah. And then from that money, it's, it sounds like he, he acquired the means to get that land in, in South America. So it's definitely weird how there's so many links with Jim Jones in terms of Schaefer's methodology, but it turns out on the Wikipedia page here, there's actually a, 
link in the lineage. So it says here, Schaefer followed the teachings of American preacher William M. Branham, one of the founders of the post-World War II healing revival, who is also an influence on Jim Jones. The source here is uh, this uh, research about Colonia Dignidad and Jonestown by John Collins. So there's actually some a lot of research on the links between them. Well, and they both did choose sort of rural South America to set up their evil dominions. Yes, and both because they were facing problems with the law. Right, exactly. Very mm. interesting. Colonia Dignidad, almost 20 years before Jonestown. Like looking back, thinking about the documentary on Jonestown, the setup with the watchtowers, the loudspeakers, things like that. A lot of that is very parallel to what was going on in Colonia Dignidad. It makes you wonder if <laughs> Jim Jones studied Schaefer as an example. But while Schaefer was a Nazi, Jonestown was all about racial unity. The majority of his followers were people of color. Yeah, they definitely so had, had, they had different... Was secretly a Nazi and he believed in racial superiority and that's no why conspiracy I... theory. <laughs> <laughs> get out your tinfoil hats everyone we're getting conspiracy ish on multiversity so in looking through all this and some of the cults that nazism manifested later i was thinking that nazism could be seen as a cult in general in many ways what with the charismatic leader of adolf hitler at all do you see nazism as an example of a large-scale cult that overtook a country? Absolutely, yes. And I think that you can see this in other countries as well, North Korea, for example. But obviously, uh, Nazi Germany was the largest and most destructive version of such an organization. And yeah, I, I absolutely think it shares many parallels with things that are actually called cults, things like Jonestown and, and Colonia Dignidad and the Rajneeshis and all that, where we've got the, the eight criteria for what defines a cult. You've got milieu control. You've got explaining everything, everything through, through the mysticism of whatever the cult's supernatural beliefs are. So yeah, no, I, I absolutely think that Nazi Germany was a very, very large and very, very powerful manifestation of a cult. Yeah, well, that's a thing that a lot of governments do when they want to go to war. They say stuff like, we will win because God is great. And that's obviously, that's a logical fallacy that's uh, non-secretary, but it's also this mystical manipulation explanation for things. Yeah. In this case, the God was almost the race, the people themselves. And all you had to do was demonize a certain group of people, blame all of the problems there. It's easy to get a lot of people on your side when you create almost a religious-like ideology where... You are the good and someone else is the enemy. Well, you know, going back to what you were talking about, Katie, with how right wing dictatorships tend to get stuff done really fast. I think that is I think that is true. And, and I think the reason for that is um, partly because there's this common enemy thing, which, uh, of course, is usually very destructive. But like, think about when there's a mosquito or something like that near you. Like, I, I, maybe you don't do this, but for me, I'm just like, I gotta kill it. I gotta kill it now. And like, <laughs> it, like, it focuses your mind like nothing else. It definitely seems to be exploiting human nature in that way. It taps into our tribalism. It taps into some of our deepest, most base instincts and exploits them for horrific ends. Yeah, for sure. Kurt, do you have any thoughts on Nazism as a cult? Okay, so we, I, I should note that those eight criteria for thought reform are actually based on analysis of Maoist China. So I guess it's not surprising at all that we would see parallels between those and Nazism. Of course, it's interesting that we see a lot of those things in, in cults as well. So it's like how to control people on a large scale. Here's the handbook, basically. <laughs> so yeah, I guess you call that a cult. Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess Maoist China was, and still communist China, is kind of culty. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, the eight criteria were written about that. And it is, it, it is much bigger than Nazi Germany. I mean, it's a billion people uh, versus, I don't know, 100 million people, something like that. But they're very different. You know, one is leftist and not militaristic. Like China doesn't, I mean, have, have, have they gone and tried conquering other, I, I guess they've been kind of a little bit militaristic, 
uh, and like territorial, trying to take more territory for themselves. But it seems like they're more of like a leftist cult, whereas Nazi Germany was more of a rightist cult. Yeah, I suppose so. But you know what they say, getting kicked in the face, it doesn't matter if it's a left boot or right boot. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, I think the the right yeah. wing, the right wing philosophies tend to be a bit more militaristic, a bit more aggressive. Aha, uh-huh. I see. Yeah, well, China has this different perspective, I think. It's just a long traditional thing, and I might never understand it fully, but they're, they're more focused on one China. So, like, for example, with Tibet, they don't care if Tibet wants independence. They don't care. Um, other parts of China also want independence, and the government attempts to marginalize them and shut them out and demonize them. At least that's that's my interpretation. So all they want to do is maintain what they have. They don't necessarily care about conquering more. I guess they've already got a huge kingdom or a huge amount of land there. I don't know why China is seen as among the Chinese or among the, the traditional rulers of China. I don't know why it's seen as a sort of holy land, but there's definitely some factor about that. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting that we don't often look at governments as being cults, and yet the very institution that the criteria we use to determine what is and is not a cult. Those criteria were developed in relation to a government itself. There are probably, well, there are many parallels in even countries that we consider much more normal. This was a challenging topic to look into just because it was, it was so, so dark. Thank you for joining us in illuminating one of the most disturbing concentrated patches of horror in history that I've ever heard of. The moral of the story is don't be a Nazi cult. Thank you for joining us on the Multiversity Project. We hope you found this episode both mind-bending and enjoyable. We can be found all over the social media space and at multiversitypodcast.com. If you like this content, give us a like, comment, follow, share, or support us on Patreon. Catch you on the flip side. 